in the tale of Sweeney Todd. His skin was pale and his eye was odd. He shaved the faces of gentlemen who never thereafter were heard of again. He trod a path that few have trod, did Sweeney Todd. The demon barber of Fleet Street. He kept a shop in London town of fancy clients and good renown. And what if none of their souls were saved? They went to their maker impeccably shaved. By Sweeney, by Sweeney Todd. The demon barber of Fleet Street. Come by taxi. It's not only well, not well marked, but bloody expensive, I'll tell you. Yes, of course I do, Stuart. I saw your name on the thing. How are you? I'm glad you're here. Yes, I see, but I, I, I can get through that. I'm glad you're here. You look very well. Feel good. 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 You bet. Did you, uh, Artie? You or Artie should look through that and tell me if there's anything in there that, because you'll find out sooner than I will who everybody is. I should, uh, I should uh, make, find out something fast or. Is it going to be? Is it going to be? Are we going to be here the whole time till we get into the theater? Yeah. Good morning. School is convened. The credo that's kind of governed the work that Sondheim and I have done together has always been less, less is more. It's that old cliche that you've heard. Came around to doing uh, Sweeney Todd. I found somewhere that uh, another, another saying, which was that less is boring and that more is more. And it was obvious, it, it's been staring us in the face all these years. So we determined to go completely in the other direction and give more of everything than anyone had ever seen before. And uh, Sweeney so Todd opened at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane early this month. It's the fifth Stephen Sondheim musical that Hal Prince has directed. The others are Company, Pacific Overtures, Follies, and A Little Night Music. Sondheim saw a production of Christopher Bond's play, Sweeney Todd, in London in 1973. It's the story of a Fleet Street barber who, driven mad, murders his customers and arranges for their bodies to be made into meat pies. And it's set in Victorian London. Sondheim thought it would make a musical. And uh, I went to Hal and I said, would this interest you? And I showed him the script. And Hal is not the fan of melodrama and farce that I am. Those are, I think, my two favorite forms of theater. And he said, well, I could do this. Yeah, but he was clearly not very enthusiastic. And when Hal isn't enthusiastic, I immediately doubt myself. And I thought, oh boy, I bet it's a terrible idea. And I just got overcome. The trouble was that I thought maybe he was making a mistake, that I was the wrong director for it. I mean, you know, I kept saying, get Frank Dunlop, old boy. He'll know how to give you that, that, that English, you know, all street stuff and the fog and the Billy sticks along the greats and all that stuff. But I couldn't see beyond Sherlock Holmes or something like that. I don't, I don't mean it deprecatingly. I mean, it, that's the way it looked to me. And that's the way it, So I worked on it with him, but that's the way it continued to look to me for a, a, over a year. 
It wasn't until we, we decided to encompass something larger, uh, which is to say the class structure here, the, the terrible, frustrating struggle to move out of, out of the class in which you're born, which was more dramatic certainly in Victorian times. And, and suddenly it became about the industrial age, it became about the incursions of machinery on the spirit and people, on the soul, on poetry and so on. A lot of high flute and stuff, but, but in fact that's what made it possible for me to direct it. So we invited okay. Hugh Wheeler, and who did the libretti that, for A Little Night written. Music and Candide, uh, to uh, write the book for us, to adapt Chris Bond's play into a musical happen. structure. Now, the set, what we did was make a factory so that the whole play takes place in a Victorian foundry. If you ask what they make in that foundry, they make a show called Sweeney Todd. And uh, these people all work in the factory, and the sunlight never hits any of them. Though they may be on the street, the sunlight is always diffused through a filthy glass ceiling so that they never get touched by the sun, the rays of the sun are always diffused with dust and dirt, and these people are trapped in this foundry. The play is very simple, despite all that publicity about the size of the set and everything. This is the play. It's a, a nodule. It, uh, it is the pie shop on this side. It's a staircase. It is Lovett's Parlor on the other. Another thing that's thrilling is something we hit on. Uh, uh, you know, the traditional thing of having the music and the orchestra uh, 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 underscore the moments of melodrama. Well, I asked for, because it was a factory, I asked for a factory whistle. It's the most chilling sound. You'll, you'll hear it, and it, it, uh, it's quite alarming. The first time it goes off is right at the beginning of the show, and it, it has the effect of scaring the hell out of the audience. And uh, you hear a terrible scream from a dozen people in the house, and then we get on with the show. Well, <laughs> every time, every time there is a, a murder, that factory whistle goes off, and every time there is some ominous presentment of shame, the factory whistle goes off. A guy, innocent, ordinary, like you or me, his life is suddenly invaded because he has a good-looking wife, right? It's the only reason. He has a good-looking wife, and his life is suddenly wiped out. He is framed for something he didn't do and packed off to Australia for 9, 15 years or whatever. Taken out of the game. When he comes back, he's going to be different, and indeed he is. He sets about, in the first place, paying back what's been done to him. Then, and this is crucial to the musical, uh, the, best, the best single thing in the musical, as far as I'm concerned, or maybe we'll come back to that later, he then changes from that tack, and it is a shift, a, at least a gear change of one, two, three gears, he then shifts from paying back the people that did that to him to saying, you are all wiped out as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to get you all. He kept a shop in London town of fancy clients and good renown. And what if none of their souls were saved? They went to their maker impeccably shaved. Sondheim wanted Sweeney's music to create a dark and threatening mood. And for this, he drew strongly on a traditional tune from the Requiem Mass, the Dies Irae, itself concerned, like Sweeney, with death and vengeance. In this case, what I really wanted to do was write a lot of creepy music. One of my favorite tunes, if not my favorite tune ever, is the D.A. Cire. 
and I thought it would be useful to take the DA Siri that uh, and use it as the basis of Sweeney's music because he's a man who's in love with death in a way and um, it gave me a start and gave me an atmosphere because I've always found the DA Siri both moving and upsetting at the same time. It scares me and it moves me. And that's what Christopher Bond's play did. A mug of suds and a lead, the strop, and a bullet towel of oh, head. Oh. 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 One of the ways of making things creepy, of course, for me anyway, is to sing softly and very, with very dry lyrics against this kind of rumble of, gee, what's going on? Because they're not saying terrible things on the stage. Why do I feel uncomfortable? It's because something is promised. opening number having the rumbling music is very low and I put it in as low a key as possible and I have the chorus or the, the individual voices singing as low as possible it's uh, it's this feeling you know, right and always with a slight crescendo so there's always a little leaning in as if something's about to happen and then doesn't attend the tale of Sweeney Todd his skin was pale and his eye was on Shaved the faces of gentlemen who never thereafter were heard of again. Now there's an example of how you do creepy. By having a dissonance like that, and not quite resolving it, and it goes down to this chord instead of resolving it, and you feel a little relief, and then it goes. There's just that slight dissonance, and then back to. So the, the feeling is of lifting the voice a little bit, Lifting, dropping. It may seem subtleties that nobody gets, but it creates a mood. And I don't think anybody would argue that the opening moments of this play are very creepy indeed. The tale of Sweeney Todd. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. He served the dark and a vengeful God. He served the dark and a vengeful God. What happened then? Well, that's the play, and he wouldn't want us to give it away. Not Sweeney. Not Sweeney Todd. The demon of the streets. He comes back, basically, to find his family. On discovering from Mrs. Lovett, who is an ex-neighbor, that his family has disintegrated, been destroyed by the people who framed him, he decides that he will revenge himself upon them. But this is hard to do for a convict with no money, uh, no home, nothing against people who are extremely powerful. He begins by setting up his barber shop again and then trying to entice the people who did that to him to the shop. He succeeds but messes it up. But in the meantime and in between times, 
he does actually manage not to mess up the killing of a blackmailer from his past. Having done that, he finds that he has a taste for blood. There was a scene in Bond's play, the second scene of the show, and it's Mrs. Lovett's pie shop. Todd enters. Says, are you all asleep? Some food here. And Mrs. Lovett enters. She says, are you a ghost? He starts for the door, fearing he has been recognized. He's a, a fugitive. Hey, don't go running out the minute you get in. I am not doing this with any Cockney accent. I hate to tell you. Uh, I only took you for a ghost because you're the first customer I've seen for a fortnight. Sit you down. He sits warily. You'd think we had the plague the way people avoid this shop. A pie, was it? He says, a pie, yes, and some ale. She gets the pie. Mind you, you can't hardly blame them. There's no denying these are the most tasteless pies in London. I should know. I make them. She puts the pie on the table and flicks a bit of dirt off the crust. Ugh, what's that? But can you wonder, with meat the price it is? I mean, I never thought I'd see the day when grown men and good cooks, too, would dribble over a dead dog like it was a round of beef. She goes for some ale. And then she goes on while she brings him chatting away about, you know, how you can't get any meat and all that. Well, what I did was, I, the first thing I thought was, I took a cue, I thought, that's fun, flicking the dirt off the pies. And I thought, why doesn't, why isn't the whole shop just alive with roaches and flies and dust and, and the fact, it's, it's not just a joke, the fact that she hasn't any customers and she's a slattern. And I thought it would be fun to punctuate the song with her constantly doing things like wiping her greasy hands on her apron and blowing things off the pies and, ca and slapping uh, cockroaches and things like that. So the song is filled with little punctuated moments, which also give it a rhythmic vitality and also give the actress various bits of business to do. So the, the piece then could become a tour de force. It's meant to be a chattery woman, a woman who's gabbling on, but at the same time, a practical. I mean, the, the whole thing about Mrs. Lovett, I think, is that she is an immensely practical woman. She always thinks, now, wouldn't it be a good idea to do this, and wouldn't it be a good idea? And, and that first number actually states that. It's got to grab the audience's attention, particularly since what they've just gone through is five to ten minutes of very brooding and intense and atmospheric and creepy stuff, and I want the contrast to be sudden and sharp, just the way the contrast between the two characters is sudden and sharp. Todd, the brooding, totally self-involved, obsessive man, and Mrs. Lovett, the cheerful, totally amoral, practical, chatty lady. I figured she should be on stage first. Uh, I have her cutting dough. And she's, the first thing she does is stick the knife in the counter. I thought, that's the way to start the number, is with the punctuation of the knife in the counter. Ah! A customer! Wait! Watch your rush, watch your hurry. You gave me such a fright. I hoped you was again. And we really got to sit you down, sit. When she says, sit you down, sit, she takes the stool and slams it on, on the ground for him to sit on and blows dust off the, the pie, and then she plucks something off a pie and drops it, and then she flicks something else. From the way that people keep avoiding... And then she smashes a cockroach. Those I try, so look, but there's no one comes in even to inhale. Right you are, so would you like a drop of ale? Well, I've got three things I'm thinking of. A, not to destroy my voice. B is to breathe at the same time as doing a hell of a lot of business and gabbling out these lines, and C is to perform it. And she's going, wait, what's your rush, what's your hurry? You gave me such a fright, I thought you was a ghost. Half a minute, can't you sit, sit you down, sit. All I meant is that I haven't seen a customer for weeks. Did you come here for a pie, sir? Where she flicks. Do forgive me if me head's a little vague. Ugh, what is that? She plucks it off. But you'd think we'd had the plague from the way that people keep avoiding. No, you don't. That's, no, you don't. And she catches one like that. Heaven knows I try, sir. Ugh. And so she's wiping and she sees what she's done. But there's no one comes in even to inhale. Right you are, so would you like a drop of ale? Mind you, I can hardly blame them. These are probably the worst boys in London. I know why nobody cares to take them. I should not. Never thought I'd live to see the day Men 
think he was a tree. Find it poor animals. What are dying in the street? Mrs. Mooney has a pie shop. Does a business, but I'm noticing something weird. Lately, all our neighbours' cats have disappeared. Add to add it to a what I calls enterprise. Popping pussies into pies. Wouldn't do in my shop. Just the thought of it's enough to make you sick. And I'm telling you, them pussy cats is quick. No denying times is harder, even harder than the worst pies in London. Only lard and nothing more. Is that just revolting or greasy and gritty? It looks like it's molting and tastes like well, pretty. Translucent date 26780, production number 88424, date recording 11780, take one. There was the scene in Bond's play, which uh, which is necessary to the plot, which is the bane, I'm sure, of I was going to say of every opera uh, composer's existence. But probably some of them enjoy it. I can't stand it when you've got what's what I call the peasants on the green sequence. That is to say, where you have a crowd, and there's absolutely no reason that all the crowd should be singing the same thing, and yet. They're a chorus, and they have to sing the same thing. And suddenly, the reality of the scene goes out the window. The scene is uh, one in which a charlatan, um, barber, and uh, seller of hair tonic named Pirelli, uh, in which the apprentice is trying to sell this perfectly terrible hair tonic to a crowd. It was Pirelli's miracle elixir. That's what did the trick, sir. True, sir, true. Was it quick, sir? Did it in a tick, sir? Just like an elixir ought to do. It occurred to me that the way to treat it was that some members of the crowd would want to buy it, and some members of the crowd would be hesitant about buying it. And the function of the scene is that Sweeney comes into it and puts the hair tonic down. That is to say, he, uh, he, he, he uh, invades against it so much that Pirelli has to make an appearance and then Todd is enabled by that to challenge Pirelli to a contest, a barbering contest, and that's how he establishes his, rep his reputation. That's the function of the scene. It's an unavoidable scene because uh, Todd has to establish his reputation or the plot can't go on. So I was faced with that problem, and I thought, okay, it's primarily a static song. I mean, until Todd comes into it, it's just, buy this hair tonic. No, I won't. Buy this hair tonic. Yes, I will. Buy this hair tonic. Maybe I will. That's the only thing you can have between Tobias and the crowd. I couldn't think of anything else. And that is the kind of scene that drives me crazy in operas. Unless the chorus singing is very, very thrilling indeed. It's, come on, let's get on with the story. I got the idea. Grow a little wixer, then some fuzz. The Pirelli soon to make a fixer. Like a good elixir, always does. Trust the Pirellis if you have a sixer. Fix it in the nixer, don't look grim. Well, clearly it had to be a developed number. And I also had to get Todd into it. And of course, by the time Todd comes into it, then the number does start developing and has a dramatic shape. And the last half of the number is fun. So I thought, 
There are numerous devices to keep an audience interest alive. The, probably the easiest and most effective and most legitimate one is to write a lyric that is fun in and of itself. And faced with that problem, I was, the, the solution seemed to me to be staring me in the face uh, because Bond called this hair tonic Pirelli's Miracle Elixir. Well, Elixir immediately suggests a series of rhymes that have to do with the word sir, such as trick, comma, sir, nick, comma, sir. It was Pirelli's Miracle Elixir. That's what did the trick, sir. True, sir, true. Was it quick, sir? Did it in a tick, sir? Just like an elixir ought to do. And I thought I could build up enough of those so that the number would have a certain dazzle to it, so that the, the lyrics would have a certain delight in and of themselves simply because the rhyme would keep on going and you'd wonder, as in a good Cole Porter song, how many variations he can make on it. What it is is a series of rhymes to, for Elixir. I don't know how many, but I'll bet there are 15 or 18, none of which are repeats. I mean, I never use Nick twice or Trick twice. But Ick is a very easy word to rhyme in the language. So once you've got the idea of Ick, sir, you've got the, the lyric made. By Pirelli's Miracle Elixir Anything what slicks up Soon sprouts curls Try Pirelli's When they see our fixer You can have your fixer On the girls Wanna buy a bottle, miss? What is this? Oh, oh, what is this? Smells like piss like this Smells like this Smells like this This is piss Piss with me Keep it off your boots, sir. Eat sprites. Don't get crazy. Sketch. Pirellis. Use a bottle of it. Ladies seem to love it. Flies do too. <laughs> Miracle elixir, grow a little wixer, then some fuzz. Feed Pirelli, sooner make a fixer. Luck good elixir, always does. Trust the Pirelli, if you every sixer, fixes the elixir, that the cream. Just Pirelli's miracle elixir, that do the tricks, sir. If you got a kick, sir. Adolfo Pirelli, the king of the barbers, the barber of kings, the bonjour of the day. I will show you a kiss. It's part of the life of a show that uh, that uh, you have to uh, take away material sometimes, good material. I'm sure that's going to be good. I think it's got to be better. I think this play depends so much on tension, continuous tension. So we took something out. Well, that's too bad for the fellow who used to sing it. And if I were an actor, I too would count the size of my role. But that's only if I were an actor. As a director, I know that the size of a role frequently has nothing to do with the impact of it. Cut a third of my role. It's a small part, and now there's another third of it gone. You know, it's not the part I auditioned for. Well, I know what to I say know, to you. I, know it's, I just, it's a big bore to you be know. in America, and that's why I'm cutting it. Well, I saw it twice, sir, and I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, well, know. guess what? <laughs> that's why I, well, that's what I auditioned for, you see, and if I'd have known it was going to be this small, I wouldn't have come to the auditions. I well, was going to have that section taken out of it. There's already the burst bit. Well, all right, I'll tell you what you do. You wait and see. If I make up my mind to cut it tomorrow, yeah. you decide whether you want to leave. Right. What else can I do? If he wants to leave, he can leave. It's, I've got to deal with the show. I can't deal with that. He's very good, but we'll get somebody else. What's all right? What's happening? I would not have auditioned for the show if I hadn't. I saw it in America, and I like it better that way. And I said, well, I didn't bother to say anything. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, I said, look, I'll make up my mind tomorrow morning. If you want to leave, you can certainly tell us. OK? God, you can't tell people what to do with their careers. <laughs> To shape it a face, or even a part, without it a smart, required a heart. It taken a art, I show you a chart, I study a start in, in my youth. All right, that's it. John, where are you? Let me have a quick word with you. <coughs> Don't be upset. It's, no, no, it's going to work so much better. I, know, I, know, really I mean, I just want the show to move on. Of course, now, of course. Now, two things. One is, 
And you know when you say these these razors. <laughs> The legend of Sweeney Todd has been frightening and delighting people for over a century. The earliest reference comes from Paris, when around 1800, the true story was reported of a French barber who murdered his customers and had a pastry cook make them into meat pies. That story was picked up in England by the writer Thomas Prest, who reset the barber shop in Fleet Street. Sweeney Todd appeared in a story called The String of Pearls, published in 1846 in the People's Periodical. But the idea persisted that there had been a real English Sweeney Todd. He was supposed to have lived in Fleet Street in the 1780s, a grim period when robbery and murder were commonplace. The barber shop to which he lured his unsuspecting clients was said to have been at 186 Fleet Street, close to St Dunstan's Church. In 1831, when the church was rebuilt, Piles of human bones were found, which no one could explain, lending a tantalizing hint of truth to the legend. According to that legend, Sweeney's accomplice, Mrs. Lovett, had her pie shop conveniently nearby, just off Fleet Street in Bell Yard. It was here that the dead bodies were taken and packed into pastry cases. There were vaults and tunnels running under St. Dunstan's and they linked Bell Yard with a dark alleyway at the back of Fleet Street behind the barber's shop. Those vaults are still in existence today and look as sinister as they did a hundred years ago. The earliest stage version appeared in 1847. It was written by George Dibden Pitt and it was even more melodramatic than the original. Then in 1878, Charles Fox published another written version in 48 parts. Others followed and in each, Sweeney became more and more villainous. More recently, the actor Norman Carter Slaughter devoted his career to Sweeney, even changing his name to Todd Slaughter in deference to the character. He played the part over 4,000 times and took Sweeney to the cinema in 1936. Been long from England, sir? Twelve years. Your friends and relations will be glad to see you back. I have no relations that I travel about or who travel about me. And friend? None in this country. All alone in the world, as one might say. Well, not quite. I've brought plenty of companions with me who'll make me friends wherever I go. I understand, sir. Golden companions with the head of His Majesty on them, eh? They're the best friends a man can have. <laughs> you are wise to keep them with you, sir. Banks can't be trusted. Is the soap to your liking? Most delicately perfumed. And the water hot enough? Perfect. Then we'll see if my razor will suit you. Tobias, go and see the time by the clock at St. Dunstan's. You've got five minutes to twelve o'clock, sir. Oh, then you must be hungry, my little man. See, here's a penny for you. Go and ask Mrs. Lovett to give you one of her largest pies. Thank you, sir. And you need not return until you've eaten it all. See if you can make it last you while you walk to Charing Cross and back. Thank you, sir. This was the stuff the original melodrama was made of. However, it wasn't until Christopher Bond's play was written in 1969 that Sweeney Todd was given a plausible motive for his actions. And this new realism was what attracted Sondheim to Bond's version of the story. Christopher Bond's play is a story of revenge. And when Sweeney misses his chance for revenge, he's driven to madness. In the musical, this happens near the end of Act One in a number called Epiphany. After Todd has failed to murder the judge, now preying on his long lost daughter, Joanna. The judge uh, who uh, had him deported is the, the man, of course, primarily that he wants to get. And uh, uh, he. Uh, he sets up for the judge to come to his uh, the parlor to be shaved. And uh, they uh, chat together and, and sing together in a seemingly friendly way about the pleasures of pretty women. Pretty women, 
Fascinating. Sipping coffee. Dancing. Pretty women are a wonder. Mrs. Lovett pretty told him to women. wait and take things slowly. He savor it to the full so that the shading takes a little longer than he originally intended. And just as the razor was coming, there is an interruption. And so just when he steeled himself to do it, he is, he is thwarted and goes raving. In comes Mrs. Lovett. He says, what's the matter, dear? What's all this running around? And he said, I, I had him. I had him there. He's, I had his throat bare beneath my hands, and now he's gone, and he'll never come again. And it's your fault, because you told me to wait. He says, what's the matter, dear? Wait, wait. No, no, he says, no, it's too late. The, everybody deserves to die, including you, Mrs. Lovett, including me. And I'll tell you why, because there are two kinds of people in this world. There's the man, there's the one staying foot in his proper place, and there's the one with his foot in the other man's face. We all deserve to die. And this, this is where his, 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 uh, schizophrenia we've been calling it but, but this is where you know his obsession his obsession absolutely breaks right through and she goes my god he's got bananas and 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 he sings this uh, not very long but very taxing uh, uh, aria i think one could call it uh, uh, which uh, is his final explosion of black rage against not only judge turpin not only london but the world all all humanity because the lives of the wicked should be made brief for the rest of us, death will be a relief. We all deserve to die. Let's take a second, just a couple of things, because I'm concerned about you. One of the things, remember, hers is, a, she, she, she's dense. She's hardly as sophisticated as he is. So when he says that thing about, it's you must die, that scares the shit out of her. It's what I was talking to you about before, about her. She doesn't die. She never dies. Uh, I, I was saying earlier, the whole, among other incredible differences in the two of them, are one is that, that he must live until he wreaks his vengeance, yeah. and then he need not live any longer. In her case, it, she will live forever, I mean, in her head. So when he says that, she doesn't understand what that means, but she knows one thing, it scares the holy hell out of her. Really frightens her, it's like pins her to the wall. What do you mean, even you? It's, you know, even me. The other thing is, uh, Larry said, and I think it's very right, the stuff there, that first stuff there, is a caged tiger, isn't it? It's, 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 a, it's, it's an animal. It's an animal cage. You want to think of it as a knife fight, but you're not tracking something. What were you doing there? You were doing what I'm, what I'm doing. You, you did a little bit, kind of, you had your knees together instead of your legs spread. Where are we? Where are we? Right, right after up you've there, got the right razor you before are, you jump down the stairs. Yeah, before you come down. That's you, so you begin to track your victims. Yes. <clears throat> the only other element that's missing is, is an element of, of uh, bloodthirsty hysteria, almost, almost into, almost into, I can taste it, I, almost into laughter, a kind of laughter, a kind of maniacal laughter. You know, I don't want you to laugh going up the steps. Do not misunderstand me. It's down there, it's I can taste it, I can taste it. Get in the, I can taste vengeance now. So, hmm. After those, those slashes then, after I will have oh, you, yeah. can be more gleeful. Yes. Gleeful. Not, no phony laughs going up the stairs. No, That's not understand. what we, nobody wants no. that. Uh, we'll have the music and let's, we'll go on. I won't, I won't uh, press right. it vocally, but I... Okay, uh, all right. No, I love even you, Mrs. Lovett. That's, that's what's right. I had him, and then... This was the most difficult number I had to write in that I had to motivate Todd from wanting to kill one man to wanting to kill everybody. And what I did was I took his, his motifs and the DA series and I mixed them together into kind of a nightmare piece. Uh, the major point of this number is that the mood changes constantly, that you're watching a man's mind crack. So it goes from keening lyrical things when he's mourning his uh, dead wife, which is a theme that plays throughout the show, this theme that has numerous purposes, which I will not go into since it might give something away, but this theme of, uh, you have the, the accompaniment going. You have... I'll never see Joanna. That's his daughter, of course. I'll never... Uh, a 
whole thing where he gets violent and he threatens uh, the audience and uh, and then he comes back. It's constantly shifting mood between this violent uh, thing. All right, you sir, how about a shave? Come on, visit your good friend, sweet, etc., etc. And then going right back in. Oh well, well, a guy should go on. Um, all right, you sir, how about a shave? Come and visit your good friend, Sweeney. You sir, to sir, welcome to the grave. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. He's keening. I will have vengeance. It is. It's a trinity. That's why it's called an epiphany. He is. He's in love with death in, the, in, the, in that sense. So the, the number constantly varies and uh, shifts between moods. Not just those two moods, there are other moods too. There's the murderous mood with which it starts out. And he absolutely goes totally ape. And there are, there are these percussive chords that come throughout. Which is like somebody just going crazy, just going over and over and over again. And that's, that's the moment when, when he goes completely out of control. So taking those themes, and mixing it in with, with uh, when he's talking about how he's going to murder everybody in the world, he does it to a, a chugging engine-like theme. And uh, he's, he, has, he has just said uh, uh, he, uh, the orchestra is going crazy with him. And he's saying, there's a hole in the world like a great black pit that is filled with people are filled with shit that the vermin of the world inhabit it. And he says, but not for long. Disguise. We all deserve to die. They all, excuse me. They all deserve to die. They didn't tell you why I can't. I haven't done this in a while. Once more. They all deserve to die. Tell you why, Mrs. Love, and tell you why. Because, and then it goes on, and I'm not going to do the whole piece, but it's it's uh, it it, uh, it 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 keeps switching between quick and slow and violent and lyrical and it's a guy going crazy is what it is. All right, you sir, how about a shave? Come and visit your good friend Sweeney. You sir, two sir, welcome to the grave. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. Who sir? You, sir. No one in the chair. Come on, come on. Sweeties, waiting. I want you bleeders. Who, sir? Anybody? Gentlemen, now don't be shy. Not one man. No, not ten men. Nor a hundred can assuage me. I will have you. And I will get him back even as he gloats in the meantime i'll practice on less honorable throats and my lucy lies in ashes and i'll never see my girl again but the work waits i'm alive at last and i'm full of try a smile Try just a just a, tink, a twinkle in the eye the first time you say you sir, welcome to the <clears throat> the very first welcome one. To, yeah just just something in the mm. eyes that suddenly there's some joy Never coming. See my girl again. That's Finish. so painful right and now all right that's it. How about a shave? Just the littlest bit. Not, yeah. Yes. Come on. Bring us in. Visit welcome to the grave. You good friend Sweeney. You sir, two sir, welcome to the grave. I know why. It just simply scares me twice as much yeah. from my seat in the theater, that's yeah. all. Yeah. By demonstrating musically that his mind is cracking, I hoped to convince the listener that he was indeed going to go on a much wider swath of vengeance than just his immediate goal, which seems at this moment to have been taken away from him permanently. So that was that was the notion. That was the notion, and it, it took me a month uh, to do this piece, and um, not because it's complicated, although it seems complicated, but to get the tone of it right, because it's pivotal in the, in the show. That the, it, the subsequent action depends on your believing this moment, and I think you do believe it now. It also gives the actor the same kind of tour de force that Mrs. Lovett had early on in the, in the show. I mean. The, 
That sounds crass, but you have to consider that too. There, there are balances, there are weights and balances in a show where you, where you want an actor to have a chance to, to just go. And this gives him his chance. Because the lives of the wicked should be made brief for the rest of us, death will be a relief. We all deserve to die. And I'll never see Joanna. No, I'll never my good to me. Finished. All right. You, sir, have about a shame. Come and visit your good friend, sweetie. You, sir, too, sir, welcome to the great. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. Ah, who, sir? You, sir? No one in the chair. Come on, come on. Sweeney's waiting. I want you leaders. You, sir? Anybody? Gentlemen, now don't be shy. Not one man. No one, not ten men. No one. him back even as he gloats in the meantime i'll practice on less honorable throats and my lucy lies in ashes and i'll never see my girl again but the work waits i'm alive at last and i'm full of Steve Venn has the audacity to, to go straight from that, I mean straight from that, with just the most tenuous dialogue link, into A Little Priest, which is the, uh, uh, the funniest number in the show, the most vaudevillian or, or musical comedy type number in the show, which is full of humor, well, black, yeah. very black humor, but nevertheless humor. Well, he's done his first murder, uh, and there's the body in the um, trunk. So there they are, stuck with this body, which... Todd isn't overly worried about it, but poor Mrs. Lovett stuck with a body in her parlour and is in a panic. What to do? How to get rid of the body, for God's sake? And he won't listen to her because he's just done this big number Epiphany, which is the revenge motive. So she's just saying, come on, what are we going to do about the body, Lord? Then she gets this idea. You know me. Bright ideas just pop into my head. Seems a downright change. Shame. Seems an awful waste. Such a nice plump frame. What's his name has? Had. Has. She hasn't got enough stuff for her pies, and Mrs. Mooney uses pussies, but she's not. She's out of wind, and she can't catch these pussies for pies. So there's this lovely bit of flesh up in the trunk. How about it? And then they go into this fantasy of all the various flavours that they'll make. Uh, pies. It sounds ghastly, but it is very funny, actually. You need it at that point. I mean, with the price of meat, what it is, when you get it, if you get it. <sighs> Good, you've got it. Take, for instance, Mrs Mooney and a pie shop. Business never better using only pussy cats and toast. Now a pussy's good for maybe six or seven at the most. And I'm sure they can't compare as far as taste. Mrs. Lovett, what a charming notion. Well, Eminently practical and yet the most as always. Mrs. Mrs. Lovett, how I live without you all these years, I'll never know. Think about how it. Lots of other gentlemen will soon be coming also for a shave. Also a tech How choice, how rare. Price. For what's the sound of the world out there? Wop, Mr. Todd, wop, Mr. Todd, what is that sound? Those crunching noises pervading the air. Yes, Mr. Dodd, yes, all around. It's man devouring man, my dear. Then and who are we to deny it in here? These are desperate times, Mrs. Light, and desperate measures are called for. Here we are, hot from the oven. What is that? It's priest. Have a little priest. Is it really good? Sir, it's too good, at least. Then again, they don't commit sins of the flesh, so it's pretty fresh. 
Awful lot of fat. Only where it's at. Haven't you got poet or something like that? No, when they're as scrawny as poet, you don't really know it. No. What is that line called? No, when it's as no, when it's as scrawny as poet, you don't always know it's deceased. Try the priest. Heavenly. <laughs> not as hearty as bishop, perhaps, but not as bland as curate either. And very good for business. Always leaves you wanting more. The trouble is, you only get it on for on Sundays. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Did I say Friday? Yeah. Oh God, I'm going mad. Ah, oh, trouble is, you only get it on month. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Friday, Friday. Trouble is, you only get it on Friday Sundays. Friday. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, she thinks that she's got through to him. I mean, that's her motive all the way through the number. Aren't I clever? Wouldn't it be lovely if we did this? And she's leaping around thinking, oh, God, he loves me, and I've thought of something wonderful. Although she didn't think of it for that reason. She thought of it for practicality, because she needs meat for her pies. But then she thinks, when he's, she sees how pleased he is. But I, I think Todd is really only going along with her, because it actually is a way of disposing of the bodies. And also it appeals to his slightly warped sense of humour. But I don't think they ever have much in common, really. She's too light-headed and, and not so obsessed, or not the same obsession. There's an element of her wanting to please you. Yeah, through this well, that's what I'm trying song. to do. Go with it. I'm trying to do that. Go that's what all that dancing around him is meant to go be. Go with it. It's terrific. I mean, just really go with it. You know, really nicely. You're never quite secure, are you? Oh, no. You're right back to Absolutely one not. each time. Mm -hmm. You're trying again. He goes, then he pulls back. Then you try again. Yeah. yeah but that's, that'll keep something going in the number that's tense. I guess that's what I mean at the beginning of the number, the tentativeness of the awfulness of the idea. I mean, he's been screaming and shouting. Fine. He might easily Just cut my throat. Not that's the only mm. I can't think of another word okay. for what makes it seem cute but, co but coy. Right. And if it's not mm. coy, then mm. tentative's fine. But I, but I want to get this wariness of this animal that she fine. suddenly sees. And it's there, right? Ingratiating. You start to be, and then he pulls back. Yeah. Then, it's up then, to me a lot too, isn't it? It, is, yes, it? it means that even when I get gleeful, it's got to be a dangerous, yes, a dangerous that, physical animal yes, gleefulness. Yes. Then, 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 then there's this tension, which I think then keeps it right in the show. Mm -hmm. well, that's really all. Yeah. Yeah. And it never so, turns into yeah. hijinks. Yeah. You know, that's all. Yeah. But it's a much. It's hard. It's an awfully narrow well, line to tread, isn't it? Sure mm -hmm. is. Well, the function of this number, of course, is not only to give a rousing finale to Act One. Uh, but also to further the plot, because this is where the uh, partnership is formed between uh, Mrs. Lovett and Todd. Uh, but also, of course, by this bold, bold stroke of, of throwing the funniest number straight after the blackest number to give the audience the most colossal sense of, uh, of release and relief after this awful confrontation with blackness and despair to have this marvelous release into into laughter albeit uh, very very chilling laughter it brings the curtain down for the interval on on a note of terrific uh, demonic glee instead of demonic hatred have charity towards the world my pet yes yes i know my love we'll take the customers that we can get I mourn and blow, my love. We'll not discriminate great from small. The wheel serve anyone, feeding anyone, and to anyone at all. At all. Yeah. When do you come in, and to anyone? Yeah. I think you should come in on meaning anyone. We'll serve anyone, meaning anyone, and to anyone. You're right. In for the second one and out for the last I, one. I think so. We'll not discriminate great from small. No, we'll serve anyone, meaning, meaning anyone, and to anyone. And I just wonder whether uh, he says, meaning anyone, and to anyone, meaning you. You'll all end up being cannibals along with the rest of us. That seems, that seems real wicked to me. We'll so, not. Come and great from small. No wheels, sir. Anyone, meaning anyone, and to anyone, right out there. Oh, that means we're going to stop the sway. Do you care? I'd really lay it on them. No wheels, sir. Anyone, meaning anyone, and to anyone at all. That's stronger. 
That's better. Yeah. Is it possible they can take in the audience more? This is the last one, all the way through. No, it's the end to end to anyone. So that, so that I felt like, oh. oh. We'll not discriminate great from small. No, we'll suck anyone, meaning anyone, and to anyone at all. At all. Sweet. Oh, Mr. Todd, oh, Mr. Todd, what does it tell? Is who gets eaten and who gets to eat? And Mr. Todd, too, oh, Mr. Todd, who oh, gets to sell? But fortunately, it's all so clear that, that everybody goes down well with this. Now, since Marine doesn't appeal to you, how about Rear Admiral? Too salty. I prefer General. With or without his privates? <laughs> With his extra. <laughs> what is that? It's fop. Finest in the shop. Or oh, we have some shepherd's pie peppered with actual shepherd on top. <laughs> and I've just begun. Here's a politician so oily, it's served with a doily, not one. Leave it, son. Well, you never know if it's going to run. Try the briar, try the dryer. No, the clergy is really too coarse and too mean. It's an actor that's compactor. Yes, and always arrives overdone. Uh, but come again when you have judge on the menu. Wait! We may not have judge yet, but we have something that you may fancy even more. What is that? Executioner. A charity towards the world, my pet. Yes, yes, I know, my love. We'll take the customers that we can get. My born and low, my love. We'll not discriminate great from small. The whales are gay. Sweeney Todd, part three, transmission date 26780, production number 88424, date recorded 11780, take one. Attention, please. Are your nostrils a quiver and tingling as well as the delicate luscious and rosy smell? Yes, Act two opens up with a roaring success that they are making the most popular pies in London out of these people. Uh, Sweeney has a nagging doubt. Something doesn't quite ring true. He's not entirely happy despite the fact he's prosperous, despite everything else. He still wants to go ahead, he still wants to get the people who destroyed his former life, his, his personality, if you like. The problem with the opening of the second act was that I had to establish an awful lot of things at once. I had to establish the fact that the uh, meat pie shop has now turned into a thriving business and that there are gardens in the back with singing birds and terrible little potted palms and that Mrs. Lovett is, uh, you know, upwardly mobile, and she's uh, got this, uh, her 
new hostess gown on. And at the same time, Sweeney is in his barber shop awaiting the, the arrival of his brand new barber's chair. And they have to test out the chair. And she has to sell meat pies. And they have to run out of meat so that they have to get some more. And there are many things that have to happen in this number, and yet it had to be held together so that it wouldn't be just a series of disparate numbers. For one thing, if you'd had a number in the gardens and then a number about the chair, which is perfectly possible, it just wouldn't have been very inventive and would have been flat, and maybe it would have been fine. Maybe you could have written two smashing songs. But one of the problems with that is that a song that merely says uh, she's, her eating establishment is now thriving and she has a lot of people and she's feeding a lot of mouths and having a lot of pies, that's not enough for a song. That's enough for a verse of a song, but it doesn't move anywhere. Uh, whereas if you mingle it with the action simultaneously of Sweeney's chair arriving, you not only have motion in the song and much more interest for the audience, but you also are able to make a, uh, uh, something for, for the actress playing Mrs. Lovett to play, which is that she doesn't know whether to keep the one eye on the till, which is, or, or she doesn't know how to keep one eye on the till, which is all the people eating the pies, and one eye on her lover colleague, Sweeney, and keep everybody happy. Because Sweeney wants her attention so he can t uh, help her, have her help him test out the chair. And, of course, all the patrons want her attention so they can eat and drink, and she doesn't want to lose a, a, a penny. So what you have, then, is the servant of two masters, and you have a scene, or what they call in opera a scena. Well, that's or a scena, I suppose. It's a proper pronunciation. But the point is that you've got something interesting. On the other hand, it's a real problem. How do you hold that together without making it sound like what I call spaghetti, meaning it's just a, a hodgepodge? Well, one of the ways you do that is you plot out the action very carefully. I plotted out the scenario of what happens in that number within an inch of its life. I had plotted it for separate tables, and then Hal had this dazzling idea of having it all done at one table, which is just so extraordinary. Uh, but it still amounts to the same thing, because she still addresses different patrons. But the idea was that she would be going from table to table, and then off on the other side of the stage, Sweeney would be whispering to her and saying, Psst, come here, come here, come here, the chair is coming. Well, I plotted out each individual action, who she served pies to, how much ale she sold, which of the patrons got drunk, which didn't, which paid for their food or not, or not because it always worked in the lyric, even though it goes by so fast that nobody in the audience may hear it. But the actress has something specific to play. She knows that she's got to treat that patron that way and that patron that way. She's got her assistant, Tobias, the kid, and he has to help her out. He has to carry things, and it was very carefully plotted who he would carry things to and where and all that. And then her, of course, her stuff with Sweeney and the, the use of all the stuff with the chair, of course, has to be plotted within an inch, an inch of its life, too, because that's a matter of timing, of testing out the chair and making the audience understand the way the chair works. <laughs> Tobias is an apprentice to a seller of hair tonic in the first act, and he is taken over by... Uh, Mrs. Lovett, and in the second act is selling meat pies. So, of course, the theme that he s sang in the first act, which was uh, called uh, Pirelli's Miracle Elixir. Try Pirelli's Miracle Elixir. That'll do the tricks. Right, it's been a long time since I've done this, but at any rate, it rhymes with tricks or quick to do the tricks or something like that. Anyway, in the second act, it becomes there you'll sample Mrs. Lovett's meat pies, savory and sweet pies, as you'll see. You who eat pies, Mrs. Lovett's meat pies, conjure up the treat pies, you step me. It's Tobias's theme, and that's what he sells pies with. Now, when Mrs. Lovett makes her entrance and sings to the various people with equal sin insincerity, because she doesn't care about anybody, but she's being nice to everybody because she wants their money, uh, she sings a variation on that instead of his theme. Sorry. She is singing. Nice to see you, dearie. How, how have you been keeping? So, what she's singing is. Nice to see you, dearie. How have you been keeping? Call me Bouncy Sweepy, Toby. One for the gentleman here, the bird is cheapy. Helps to keep it cheery. Toby, throw the old woman out. And the chorus comes in with their three note, note motif. That, that's good. And those, those three notes then become developed later. All right, so we've got Toby's motif and Mrs. Lovett's motif. Now, when Todd gestures her to come over, what we have is Todd's motif utilized as 
uh, in, in a different way. Remember, I told you earlier that, that, that one of his light motifs of the show, particularly when he is in a murderous mood, is this motif. Well, I took that and just divided it into the chords them, themselves and then played it lightly so that when he's, he's being conspiratorial with her, the music you get is... And he's going... Excuse me, that's her to the customers. Excuse me, Psst. dear, see to the customers. Psst. Yes, what love, quick, now the trade is quick. And they start making their little conspiracy to that motif, which is... And then with with the, the uh, dum bum 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 ba da 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 that becomes important later. Then she goes back to her customers with her, what's your pleasure, dearie? And then the, the chorus starts. At that point, we start to develop the chorus a little bit, too. Instead of just going, God, that's good, they go, God, that's good, that is delicious. Always slightly dissonant to show that they're not having quite as good, or they shouldn't be having quite as good a time as they are. And... Um, she goes on, she sells stuff, and what happens eventually is, of course, the chair arrives, and then we get, when they see the chair for the first time, this is Lovett and Todd, they both admire it by going, ooh, ooh, which is, of course, the same thing, Todd's theme. Slightly varied. Ooh, and out of that, ooh, comes the chair theme. Is that a chair fit for a king? Oh, wondrous, sweet, and most neat, and most particular chair, etc. So that what we get then is a lyrical theme. Wondrous, sweet, and most particular chair. It's sweet when it comes to the pies later. You tell me where is the receipt can half compare with this particular I'm leaving out some of the notes because, as I said, I haven't played in a while. But that's, that's the notion of it. And finally, of course, what happens is when everything is going on at once and Mrs. Lovett is being torn between both places and it gradually builds and uh, they test the chair out and all that, eventually, at the climax, of course, the themes are all going on at the same time. And, for example, you've got uh, Mrs. Lovett is singing, How about it, dearie, be here in the twinkling? And meanwhile, Tobias is going, is that, is that, is that a pie fit for a king, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Tobias is taking the chair theme, which she has brought downstairs, and applying it to the pies instead of to the chair, et cetera, and she is going around, uh, how about a dearie, and, and uh, Todd is upstairs uh, fiddling around with the chair. And, and they, they go together and eventually climax with everybody singing on the God That's Good. What's my secret? Frankly, dear, forgive my candle family secret. All to do with herbs, things like being careful with your coriander. That's what makes a gravy grand. Oh, Excuse me, dear, see to the customers. Yes, what? Now, quick, though, the trade is brisk. But it's here. It's where? Coming up the stair. I'll get rid of this lot, but they're still pretty hot. It's and about not to be there. over there, don't you care? I'll be there, I'll be there. The love will be so divided, I'll get called. Incidentally, dearie, you and a Mrs. Moonly, sales have been so dreary. Don't be poor thing is penniless. What about that loony? Looking sort of bleary. Oh, well. Is that a chair fit for a king? A wondrous, it's sweet, gorgeous. and most particular chair. Now tell me, where is the receipt? Can half compare with this particular thing? I have a few minor adjustments to make. Adjustments. They'll take you take your time as goes to the customers. I have another friend. Yum. Is that a pie fit for a king? A wondrous sweet and most particular thing. Why there is no meat pie can compete with this delectable pie. The crust of the ready gravy that glaze those creams and then those creams and then those creams. 
Excuse me, dear, see to the customers. All set, love. Quick now. My heart's a flutter. I pound the floor. And you pound the floor. Signal to show that yes, I'm ready to go. Yes, you told me, I know you'll be ready to go. You pound the floor, will you trust me? Will I just you trust me? I've been waiting for love for the wizard to blow. I'll pound three times. Three times. And then you. Three times. If you. Exactly. Oh, After uh, God That's Good, um, where we see, um, we see that um, they're now fairly prosperous and um, uh, the pies are going well and the tonsorial parlour is also going well and the new chair arrives with the <laughs> mechanism. And um, uh, then we see a further stage. The next sequence is a further stage in Todd's uh, madness. The walk through London, which is called Joanna, is my favorite in the whole show because I think it's Sondheim at his best. I think it's probably me at mine. And it represents a collaboration. You have Anthony looking, Joanna behind the bars of her cell in Bedlam. You see Sweeney in his shop reflecting on Joanna. You see the beggar woman wandering through London madly at night. She knows there's something going on at Lovett's pie shop, and you see Lovett stoking the fires to make the meat pies. It took me about two hours to stage that number, and I did it first time out and never had to go back and improve upon it. We've had one sort of almost accidental killing in the first part. We've had this explosion of rage and madness. We now see the day-to-day -day routine calm killing of a, of a mass killer who has gone into another dimension, who can sing uh, movingly and beautifully about his daughter, who is, must now be 16 or 17, but he's never seen since she was a baby. And while, and while singing about the beauty of her yellow hair is almost subconsciously slitting a throat and dispatching the body to be made into pies. It is the most extraordinary, dreamlike piece of macabre theatre. I feel you, Joanna. I feel you. Do they think that walls can hide you? Even now I'm at your window, I am in the dark beside you, buried sweetly in your yellow hair, Joanna, Joanna. And are you Beautiful and pale, with yellow hair like her. I'd want you beautiful and pale, the way I dreamed you were, Joanna. And if you're beautiful, what then, my little dove, my sweet? I think we 
shall not meet again, my little love, my sweet Johanna. Yet you're mine. I'm fine, Joanna. Joanna. I'm fine. You almost want to laugh. You know, it's 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 almost funny. It's almost tragic. It's almost pathetic. And, it's, and it is all those things all in one, all tied up into this wonderful lyrical, dreamy music. And if I never hear your voice, my turtle dove, my dear. I still have reason to rejoice, the way ahead is clear, Joanna. And in that darkness where I'm blind with what I can't forget, it's always morning in my mind, my little lamb, my pet, Joanna. You stay, Joanna, the way I dream you are. Oh, look, Joanna, a star. A shooting star. This sequence sets us off on the final section of the piece in which the themes of revenge, injustice, crossed love and death all merge in a dark and exciting climax. Sondheim welds all this together with techniques more usual in opera. For example, the use of motifs. The notion of using motifs is to pink the audience's memory, to remind them constantly that, uh, you know, that this theme represents that idea, that emotion, or that character. They're guideposts along the way. I think in a sustained piece, you have to do that. And uh, I think uh, the, the identification of motives, well, f most audiences are used to it just from movies because movie music is based on that idea in which, you know, most movie scores consist of just a very few motifs um, uh, over and over and over again uh, until every time the motif comes on, no matter in what guise, the audience has a, an unconscious emotional response, sometimes a conscious one. Well, I think the same thing is true in, in many operas and is a very, very useful idea when you're telling a story. Also, the audience's familiarity with the themes themselves makes them feel in a way more comfortable because, you know, new music is very difficult to take in. And most people feel most comfortable with the score if they can hear what are called reprises. Well, instead of using reprises in this show, what I've done is use reprises of motifs rather than reprises of whole songs. Sometimes there are reprises of little fragments of songs. But by the time the second act rolls around, the audience is familiar with almost all the musical material. Now, there is some new musical material in the second act, but there's a great deal of reuse of the old material. In fact, I dare say there's almost nothing in the show that isn't reused at least once. You have to think in op operatic terms because someone a long time ago mistakenly identified musicals with, and musical heroes and heroines with the rather trivial, good-natured, superficial people and suffering superficial pain. The, the minute you, you go to opera, it's okay to use Medea, it's okay to use the Macbeths. It's just a matter of somebody's definition, which I think Steve and I, and surely Hugh Wheeler, would argue with. Uh, why is Traviata uh, not just a smashing good musical play which, uh, from another period, that's all? Todd is, after all, a tragic hero in the classic sense, just as Oedipus is. This is why he dies in the end. He dies because of a certain kind of fatal knowledge and a, a realization. It comes through a series of revelations, but he realizes what he has been doing and what he has done. I think it's terribly satisfying, and much more so than any kind of accidental death would be, which often occurs in flimsier forms of melodrama. I think what Bond wrote was a tragedy.